The Edify After Show Deluxe Edition with special guests Brian Bird, Lindsay Sturman, Chris McNally, Kevin Smith, Pascal Hutton, and now the host of the Edify After Show, Elliot Wallach. This episode deserves a deluxe edition. This was incredible. That was episode 11. It was the climax of the season so far. I know a lot of you are like, what was that? Wow, that happened? Yep, it did. We've got five guests here to talk about it, including Lindsay Sturman, the amazingly talented showrunner, and Brian Bird, executive producer. You guys, thank you so much for being part of the program. Excited to be here. Thank you so much for having us. So, Lindsay, what is the role of a showrunner? Yeah, the, the showrunner is sort of the head writer, and Brian was obviously the creator of the show and, and the, the, the co-creator with Michael Landon, the first showrunners. And you, you're both sort of the head writer, but you are also sort of in charge of the, the, the whole production creatively. And, and obviously, it's such a huge team. Um, and in terms of the writing of the show, you, you, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a tricky um, job to come in as, you know, I think, you know, I, I'm not the first showrunner um, and, and you have so much incredible work behind you. And so you're sort of picking up, studying it, trying to understand um, all those storylines and then take them through. Only the, sh the writers can write the show. And so that's your main focus is the story and the scripts. I, I can I can just chime in here that the writers really that writer's room sets the table for everything. And the work that Lindsay has done uh, in season 10 and now in season 11 has just been magnificent, in my opinion. I've loved every script that has come out of that room. And unless the head writer has great chemistry with the rest of the team, uh, it can fall apart. And it has not done that. It's only flourished. And so I just, uh, my hat's off to Lindsay. Yeah, this is going to be a gush fest. I really, really, I enjoyed so much the, okay, first of all, I think Ben Rosenbaum is one of the funniest guys I've been around. And I love that you're incorporating his humor into the show. The guy just totally cracks me up. He's such a nice guy too. Then um, the fact that you had Jack Wagner golfing, I love that. <laughs> is there any way to have him sing All I Need? You know, <laughs> just some early 1900 version of it, just for me, that would be great. That, that'll yeah. go on the list of things we want to see because sometimes you make a list. How did you approach the season knowing where you wanted to end, what, where you wanted it to end up? Yeah, I think that, you know, we talk about that you always write the, write the story. It's the character first. Who are these characters? What are their journeys? And there's a great analogy that I love, which is that a TV show is like a clothesline and everything hanging off the clothesline. The clothesline is the character journey and all the story points are like the clothes hanging off. It's not a perfect metaphor, but the, the story really supports a character journey. So we really looked at all the seasons and said, who are these characters? What are their journeys? And with Lucas, we really, he was somebody we didn't know that well. He has a history. He had New Orleans, Jeanette, who was, what was his past? And we started to look at who this guy, who this character was, and we really wanted to do a hero's journey for him. Sometimes the stories really reveal themselves that they were really on a different, they were on different journeys. Elizabeth and Lucas had different destinies. And how do we follow those? And following Lucas, giving him this bigger story of, you know, a man who is thinks big and does big things for the town. He runs a saloon. He brings people together and that he's sort of bound for some greatness. And she had the big life. She chose to leave Hamilton and come to this small town and have this sort of quieter life. And then as she's raising a son, she wants a simpler life. And it's for her, she's a teacher, it's her students and it's her community. And we started to see that those paths were diverging. And so then you keep writing to that. And we found this story, um, you know, that that was both heartbreaking, but also felt true to who they were. But we started to see a story where 
he it's she gets to see him grow but they also grow apart and the heartbreak of that we started to it sort of revealed itself to be a Casablanca mm. story I can't remember who, the first time someone said that but then then you just sort of start to write to, to to this idea of what if it's a heartbreak Chris is such an incredible actor and he's such a wonderful character so we get to really follow a bigger story for him into season 11. Now I'll just add Lindsay that you planted some really interesting seeds along the way. Even Elizabeth's aunt comes to town with Julie and they're helping plan, you know, start thinking about this this wedding that they want to plan. Her aunt spots that she even says, this is a man who was bound for a bigger stage. And, it, and it's very early on in the season when that line comes, but it actually, we began to, you began to reveal that along the way. And I just, I thought that was so powerful. Um, it, it sets him apart. It sets him, you know, off as a character for the audience, maybe reveals something about him that they hadn't thought about before. But by planting that idea in, in our minds as viewers, I just thought that was really solid. It was also Elizabeth's journey to follow her heart and, you know, visiting Jack's grave. Elizabeth's still in trauma from the loss mm. of Jack. And she's still struggling with that trauma and and finding her way. And it was almost like it was meant to be, like that the, the breadcrumbs had led us all there as she confronts these fears that she had that were all there in previous episodes. And it's something I think sort of special about the show that it's it's a you know, there's so many different writers and so many different people involved, and yet it's really always kind of finding its own way. The way television has evolved is really into this storytelling of an entire season, which I just think is so powerful. And obviously season one is one story and you land the plane. So the first thing we do is figure out, you know, how to how can we do a journey that also follows a story, right? And that they're constantly intertwined and telling each other. So yeah, you do start with the ending in some sense, like you you get there and it's a constant, I mean, Brian, I'm sure you can mm -hmm. talk at length about this is you're constantly going back and forth and, and figuring it out. And then we, we figured out what we a lot about season 11 before we wrapped up 10, because we wanted to make sure that, you know, we, we were really setting it up. And then how did you come up with the Hope Valley in Peril storyline? And the writers really always talk about it as the shadow on the hill. And we, because you don't, you know, other than Henry Gowan, we don't have villains, you know, none of our major cast are going to be our villains. So we, we also thinking about, you know, the status quo, where are we coming in from season nine? It was Henry Gowan had blown up the mine. Jobs have been lost. And we really leaned into this idea of tough times. And, you know, I think that, you know, it, it reflected a lot of what was happening, you know, after COVID, people gone through tough times. So you bring a lot of your personal life, obviously, into it. And we thought, well, what if something good happens, but then it gets complicated? And so we came up, we, we, were, we pitched around a bunch of ideas. Uh, we came up with a ski resort and we killed that for various reasons. Uh, but we thought it'd be funny to have like the old fashioned skis. It was the beginning of skiing. Nobody knew how to do it. And of course, that actually ended up informing the calisthenics story. <laughs> Because that yeah. also was the birth of calisthenics. And, you know, you get to one of my favorite things about the show is just going back. And the first time you hear a radio, it's just so great. So once we we knew we wanted something, you know, that brings prosperity, but also complication. And then somebody said a hot spring and that opened the door to the story to really marry it with Bill's journey. And then, of course, out of that, we came up with the sort of more complicated story of his you know, a crisis of mortality and which led to this sort of rebirth. And then that led to opening his heart to love, which of course got complicated and all kind of tied back in. And out of that came the water story. And I'm sure you've seen Chinatown. So it's, it's based on the true story of Los Angeles of stealing the water from the Owens Valley. And there's sort of this idea of the subconscious writer and that you, you don't even realize like the, as a, as a group of writers, we're writing all this stuff and then we'll go back and we're like, oh, Oh, we set that up and we didn't even realize it, but maybe subconsciously you realized it. You know what I, I was going to say too, to answer that question, you know, on your behalf, Lindsay, is that, you know, this whole arc for Lucas in season 10 has been fascinating to me because, you know, Bill Avery and, and Nathan Grant, these guys are, you know, shooting, you know, shooting bad guys and riding horses and, and, you know, gone on these great adventures and they're saving the town from bad people you know, many times during the last several seasons. 
And what we didn't have for Lucas is a hero story. And you found that, right? He He's drafted by circumstances, by the world. It's not, it's out of his control. It's out of Elizabeth's control. It's out of the whole town's control. He's been drafted by circumstances and he must, you know, at least run for governor. And we'll see what happens in season or in episode 12. But what choice does he have? What choice does Elizabeth have in all of this? What choice do any of these people have? Lucas must go on this path or the town is in deep, in deep trouble. And so that to me was such a powerful thing. It was showing a brand new side of Lucas that we had not seen before. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I felt like if this was really happening, you'd really want a guy like Lucas and probably Chris too, for that matter, to actually go up and, uh, and tackle. Like wherever he's going to go, he's going to feel like he's the smartest guy in the room. You know, on that note, is it, is it challenging to stay true to the, to the um, character's personality and find proper motivation for their storylines? That's a great question. And, and I, it's, I would almost, almost invert it and say, like, it's the, the challenge is to make sure that you don't fall in love with a story that isn't true to them so that you really just start with who are they and where could their journeys lead? And, and of course you, you think about what do you want to see, you know, and, you know, for instance, you know, Rosemary was going to have a baby. So we knew you were going to tell a baby story, right? So you, you start with things you're, you know, that you, you've, you've inherited and, you know, this richness that you inherit. And then you try to figure out, you know, what would happen to this character that it's like natural, but it's hard. And Brian, you know, I mean, this is why it takes so long to write is because it's got to kind of do everything at once. And you just keep, it's almost like clay. You just keep trying to make it smoother and smoother. So it all feels really good because I think when we're watching TV, I don't think we come to television. I don't watch TV to be, um, you know, poked in the eye or scolded or like challenged. I I come to watch TV to to you know understand the world better or feel good, right? And but you're in a zone, right? You're 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 lost in the world. And the minute something doesn't make sense, it pulls you out. And the Hardys know the characters so well. And that's why it's so wonderful to have Ali Devereaux in the room as a writer, because she's seen every episode, I'm not kidding, 15 times. <laughs> and, and I want to catch up with her because I could do that too. Um, and so she just, and, you know, and then we also have Brian reading all of our scripts and commenting and giving us notes so that we're always making sure that it just feels true to them, but is also a story. It's tricky. <laughs> Does your consideration of the fans impact your approach as you're putting together the story? I mean, the Hardys are the heart of everything we do. And obviously having Ali Devereaux, having a real Hardy in, in the room, sort of guiding us. And, you know, I think that, you know, the, the show is, it's such a unique show to ha because of the fans. And Brian, you have, you know, been the heart of, of this sort of conversation. It's one of the few shows that people watch, um, you know, at nine o'clock on Sunday night and they get to be in a conversation and, you know, they say that, you know, because of there's so much streaming sports is really the only other thing that people watch together um, and talk about. And the, the show really is about the fans. I mean, at this point, you know, I think it, it, and it's, it's a rare, I've been doing this for 23 years. I've never met a more compassionate and, and caring group of fans. Um, so I, I think we take it really seriously. So what excites you about the future of the show? I think the show could go 10 more seasons. I There are so many stories to tell and so many incredible characters. It really is... Um, you you could tell you could have two hour episodes. You could have... You have 24 episodes every season. Um, it's just, you know... Do, what, what is everybody's backstories? Can we, you know, can we explore how do they come to Hope Valley? There, there's just so much there. Um, so I, I'm hoping, Brian, I don't know about you, but I'm hoping there's 10 more seasons. You got my my support there. Anything we can do to keep this going. The, the Hardys asked us this very question at the Hardys family reunion. We said, we're trying to catch up with the Simpsons. So <laughs> we will keep doing it as long as uh, we have a network that wants us to do it. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Lindsay, Brian. Thanks so much for coming on the program and just talking us through it. Thanks, Elliot. Thank you, Elliot. <laughs> All right. So next up, Chris McNally. He's going to talk about this amazing, impactful episode as Lucas. Tiffany's on the set with him right now. 
Drama. <laughs> Lots of drama. <laughs> Lots of drama. At that moment, do you think Lucas even realized that maybe he had kind of dropped a bomb on Elizabeth? Yeah, I think he's um, kind of just trying to keep up and maybe his thoughts of what is happening in the future are not aligning with reality. And you know, I, mean, I don't know if he's fully thought it through, but that metaphor I was using of the ball rolling away, yeah. I think the ball's rolling away on him there. Yeah. And maybe do you think at that moment he could even see that, okay, this is obviously going to interfere with our wedding plans? And Oh, yeah, for sure. Yes, definitely. But I think the stakes of losing Hope Valley... Um, as exciting as a wedding is, it, that completely trumps it. You know, you, yeah. a wedding is a celebration, a party. It's going to be great, but right. um, but your home is is going to take precedence over that in this situation. Something Kevin said earlier, which is a change of landscape that allows the story to move forward. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like this change of landscape is going to be a good storyline for Lucas? Yeah, I do. I do. I think it's a good storyline all across the board. I think it allows uh, a lot of shifts and changes to happen. And through those shifts and changes, we get to follow the characters and explore more stories in Hope Valley. And and from Lucas's point of view, this whole venture into government and whatnot is, I mean, it's not something that could have been explored had he and Elizabeth gotten married. Right. I understand and I'm empathetic towards the audience members, you know, the Hardys and fans who were really gunning for this and really wanted a wedding in season 10. I think it's going to be a, um, a massive disappointment. Uh, it, I also feel like it's sometimes characters rift apart and things change. They shoot that because they made it seem like they traveled somewhere, but I got to right. think it's here in town. It's definitely here. It's just down at the other end of the street. It was in front of Gowan Petroleum. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, the window to Gowan's office right there. Okay, and so then the art department comes in and they, did they change it up? They must have changed it up a little bit, made it look more like a train station. I, well, I think the bricks are a facade, right? The bricks were probably put over top and then they just um, put a light inside the window facing the window and had a little fake desk and had uh, had somebody standing there as if he was um, counting t or accepting tickets and, oh. and whatnot and then some passengers lining up. And so you get those silhouettes and then uh, they added some steam and sound and probably changed a couple signs and maybe some light fixtures yeah. and then all of a sudden we're in a new place. It's amazing. Yeah. And they do it, I mean, you guys do it a lot on mm -hmm. this show, um, swap outs, you know, the saloon especially. Uh, the saloon has houses quite a few things. Yeah, it's been a train station in the past. Anytime we're in a, like in a suite of the saloon, that is built on the main floor just in the bar area. I just clear all the tables away and put up some walls. And uh, Lucas's office, the first season that was introduced, was also in the saloon. And then hmm. the next season, they built it into the, um, the dentist's office, which is actually, it's great that it has its own location because it means we can always go back. It doesn't have to be constructed, so it doesn't right. cost anything or um, affect the schedule in any way. Because obviously you can't shoot in the saloon if it's been turned into something else. But the benefit of shooting in the saloon is that um, the walls are not fixed. So you only see where the camera's pointing. Uh, you know, we would we could have this wall here, but the wall on the other side of us can just fly away and go away. And then you've got all that room for the cameras to be and lenses and whatnot. Whereas when you're in a fixed space, it gets very, very cramped in the in the office. <clears throat> so you're just not as there's not as much versatility and mobility available at your fingertips in terms of what you want to capture and how you might capture it. So it's more work to have it in the saloon, but there are benefits, benefits. at the same time from yeah. a cinematic standpoint. Yeah, because a lot of the spaces are kind of small. And as a viewer, are, you don't you forget there's maybe yeah. 10, 12 other people in the room. Yes, at least. <laughs> yeah. So with this storyline, how are, are you excited about this new storyline? Yeah, I am excited with the governor's storyline. I think it's great. Uh, so far since we've seen Lucas come in, he's been... Uh, he's had some business ventures, but he's, he's been very, very focused on Elizabeth being his partner. You know, he really wants to settle down with her, uh, and it gets kind of superseded. He gets taken down this other route that he wasn't expecting. Uh, but there's an excitement to that that uh, I enjoy personally because it's something new that I get to explore with Lucas. Mm -hmm. It's a it's sort of a new um, like a new chapter for him that yeah. is totally uncharted. And do you feel optimistic for the future of the show? And for the future yeah. of your character, I do. But I'm excited for where they've, where the direction that Lucas is going in, and I think that it 
is a, a different avenue of storytelling or different stories that can come in for Hope Valley. It's a town that is alive and it has a pulse and, and things shift and change and evolve. And I think it's great. I'm very optimistic about it. Well, thank you for being here. I of appreciate course. it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk to Kevin Smith. This is where fiction meets reality. Golfing with Bill Avery, Plain White by Jack Wagner. Let's take a look. Oh, I hear you got the injunction. Yes. Was that his idea so he could play some golf? Yes. I think it was the only way we could get him on set that day. He refused to come. People don't know this about Jack, but he's never played golf before. And so he came in to do this as a favor, a personal favor to me. No, I'm just kidding. Obviously, Jack's a very accomplished yes. golfer. Um, so it's this is one of those examples where they he gets to have his... Uh, his say, and I think he's been angling to have golf a bigger part of this show for a long time. Do you golf? <laughs> Terrible <laughs> golfer. I golf as well as I sing. Okay. Yeah, it's not on my list of, of, of things that I'm capable of doing. A terrible golfer. Uh, it's a miracle that Jack can still do it, though, with the back and the <laughs> knees and the rheumatism and the short-sightedness, with the hairpiece always falling off when he's bending over the ball. They say keep the eye on the ball, but he can't see the ball, so how is he supposed to keep his eye on the ball? So there are some other funny moments in this episode. Mm -hmm. One of them takes place in your office. Okay. Let's take a look at Please. it. I mean... It's fun to do those ones. We did, uh, there was another one that was similar like to that that we shot years ago where we doors get slammed and that was less about what was being spoken and more about the situational comedy of it. And um, <laughs> maybe I just have no foresight or I don't see things, but Pascal was super excited about doing this scene. And the same with the one previous when we're doing all these doors, people coming in and out and slams. And, and I was like, this, is, this scene sucks. I don't understand. What do you want to slam the doors for? What are we doing with all this water? This is so boring. And then as you're doing it, I'm like, oh, it's funny. I get it now. I see it. So it kind of creeps up on you. And uh, this is the first time I've seen it cut together. And it actually is pretty cute. Did you guys practice ahead of time? Did you talk about it, you and Pascal? No, uh, this is, again, I'm gonna guess, but I think this is Peter's episode. Peter DeLuise, he's also the guy who did the previous one with the doors, so he loves this kind of stuff, and he has an eye for comedy, and he likes these little things like the clicking the phone down at the same time, the lines in unison, and he's got this whole thing planned out in his head before we got there. I didn't know what was going to happen. Pascal didn't know what was going to happen. We walked, but she was confident that he was, that it was going to be something like the door slamming scene. And then when we got there, he told us what it was all going to be. And uh, I was leery and she was gung ho. And then we started doing it and it worked out. There was another scene like that in episode four where the birth scene, when Rosemary goes into labor. Right, that was fun to shoot too. Yeah, that was a real blast to shoot. I loved how they incorporated the whole town in that moment. That was, yeah. I didn't, Again, again, I don't have the foresight, I guess, but I thought this would be a good just Lee, like Lee and Rosemary moment, yeah. quiet. I pitched something completely different, and maybe that's telling me something because they went the complete opposite <laughs> direction to what my suggestion was, and they did it in the street with everybody else being involved, which was really funny in retrospect. Yeah, lots of choreography, and everybody got a funny yeah, moment. Everybody got a little yeah. bit. Everybody got yeah. a little moment. It was really kind of funny that way. Rothgar and yeah. Loretta got. Everybody yeah. got a moment there. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, the, the scene of Loretta running. Yeah, yeah she, she's got. The, yeah, 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 <laughs> the yeah. Heart. Yeah, she gets those. She kills those it's moments so funny. for sure. So how did they pull this off with all the water? I mean, obviously the roof is not actually leaking. No, it was. <laughs> it was they just. Yeah, no, it was a really bad rainstorm that day. No, no, it was just there's there's water tubes going up top, and they're just dripping water. We've got faucets all lined up so you can control the flow to some degree. You just get wet. And we just got wet. And in between takes, they have to dry everything, new paper, dry the whole thing down. So it was a bit of a, a rigmarole, but in the end, it's really it's kind of fun to watch. It just makes you smile. You don't, yeah. nothing really happens that pushes the story along. It's just kind of a, a cute little Lee Rosemary moment. Well, it does set up a little bit of having Henry come in because now they need That's to have right. the, the roof repaired. Yeah, that is true. That is true. Yeah. What did you think about having Henry repairing the roof, having Martin, the actor, do it? Yeah. Did you know that he was a roofer at one time? I think Martin has at one point or another in his life done every job that exists. I think he worked on the pyramids. 
<laughs> he's as old as Jack? He's almost as old as Jack. I forgot him when it comes to bugging people about he being old. I can't make fun of Martin's age because we're the same age. Okay. So I shouldn't have said the thing about the pyramids. That would imply that I, too, was there for the pyramids, <laughs> which I was not. So what do you think of the storyline bringing Martin in? Um, I love the storyline. I like Martin's storyline. I like Gowan's storyline. I think it's, uh, you know coming full circle, finding this inner self kind of thing, finding peace with his past and, and making amends for it in his own way. We used to do some scenes together back in the day when Gowan was the bad guy. Yeah. And I enjoyed doing scenes with Martin. He's a nice actor, and uh, but we just, our, our Lee's world and Gowan's world have kind of just gone their own directions for a while. So we'll see what happens in the future. But I, I enjoy doing the, the, the scenes with Martin. He's a, he's a hoot, he's a character. So Rosemary enlists him to babysit. Yeah. How do you think Lee felt about that? I don't know about Lee, but I didn't like it. I was like, why does he get to babysit the kid and I don't? Like, I want some scenes with this baby. I was baby jealous. Straight up. I didn't like it at all. In fact, I tried to sabotage the scene. Every <laughs> While he was doing the scene, I kept, like, throwing things at the baby, like little spitballs. Just so he wouldn't, maybe wouldn't play along. That completely goes against your earlier statement about yeah. caring for these yeah. children. Yeah, no, set. I sabotaged the heck out of that one. <laughs> okay. I tried to ruin the scene because I was like, this should be Lee's moment. Lee should be having these moments with the baby and 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 not. No, I'm joking. Obviously, it was really cool. It's it's cinematic gold having relationships between babies and and grownups when yeah. they when they interact well. And I think for Henry's character to have a guy who was the town bad guy for a while and now be pulled further out of his shell by, I mean, who, how can you not find a baby irresistible? There's a shot where you're looking in the window and he's holding the baby. Yes. Do, do, I can't remember how, I think you actually are, you did get to see him holding the baby. I did, yeah. yeah. No, I had the straw underneath with the spitballs <laughs> ready to go so when they were on me. <laughs> I thought he was a natural. The baby? I, <laughs> Martin. He just looks so... No. 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 CGI'd that was just the, really good they acting. They CGI'd the baby for that one. <laughs> yeah. Babies are afraid of him. Switching gears. Let's. The bachelor party's in full swing. Are we in reverse? <laughs> no. Okay. We're going we're gonna to pick up a different storyline. Okay. So a lot's been happening in the town. Mm -hmm. Lucas makes an announcement. Let's take a look at a clip. Okay. The reaction on, on Aaron's face for the champagne popping, there is an extra that's underneath. He's got a ruler and he just smacks her in the butt. <laughs> that's how we got the reaction. Oh, wow. Yeah, It's really Wanted method. To be authentic. Is that what it's called, method? Yeah. When you have... I think it's pronounced method. Oh, <laughs> right. If we're being specific. Well, we are in Canada. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think of this storyline with uh, Lucas running for governor? It certainly helps with shifting the landscape. Oftentimes in, in, in television, you got to be careful when you're getting everything you want. You have to be careful because you may reach the end and you don't necessarily want to get to the end. In, you know, in, uh, in television, you want to keep, keep going, keep the storylines going. So it does open the field for some landscape changes. And I think that uh, based on where we are this season, I think what they were planning then works. And I think that uh, it's, uh, it's going to bear fruit as we move forward, for sure. I'm excited to see excited where, where it goes. Yeah, me too. And I think that this is a really interesting storyline for Lucas. Mm -hmm. It suits his character really well. I think that unbeknownst to anybody, I think this fits. It could have tied itself up and we could have been done. But all of a sudden, things just sort of fit. And it's like, oh, this is actually, you're right, because his character is sort of pre-made for mm -hmm. this. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. And yeah. he feels like he's got big aspirations. He's very ambitious and he's got some aspirations and it gives us somewhere to go with that character yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Creatively, if I was Chris, I'd be super excited. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk about episode 11. You should be thankful. This is very burdensome to me. <laughs> well, there's one more. Oh, will, will God. You <laughs> it's never going to end. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's been a me? pleasure. <laughs> will you join me? <laughs> yeah, I'll come back. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> thing is, it has to end. Tiffany's got to go talk to Pascal about the incredible friendship between Elizabeth and Rosemary. She's talking to her right now. Let's take a look. 
Or we could just seat the chair. Maybe there's something going on that's a little deeper. Yes. Yeah. I think uh, just as you saw early on in the season, Elizabeth is so intuitive about knowing that Rosemary is going through something emotional herself. Now we see that like the tables have turned and now Elizabeth is really going through something and, and really questioning and thinking deeply about obviously her future and what's right. what's unfolding and they're such good friends rosemary can sense that of course she can and she just wants to be there for elizabeth do you think there were clues throughout the season that things weren't exactly 100 percent right that maybe they were not addressing some issues not between rosemary and elizabeth but between lucas and elizabeth I think so, but I think it's really incredibly subtle. And I think I think that it's why she's wrestling, Elizabeth's yeah. wrestling with what to do because it's not something obvious. It's not something glaring. He's a wonderful person. He's a wonderful man. He's wonderful with her son. He's wonderful to her. And so there's all these things of going, so why am I questioning this? And that's mm -hmm. really a difficult thing to wrestle with. And they share a moment in this episode where she talks to Rosemary about that. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at okay. it. Okay. She's so good in it. She's Both so of you. good. <laughs> I remember we were like, w this was a scene where we really did a lot of talking and just trying to pick the words so carefully of what is Elizabeth feeling in this moment and what is she able to even articulate in this moment and what does Rosemary intuitively see and we we were so careful with wanting to finesse that language and um and then we went in and did the scene and I mean Aaron was just so so vulnerable and open and so beautiful there's another scene it it reminds me of, but it was between Aaron and Lori. Mm -hmm. And it was very similar kind of conversation. And I feel like that scene is one of those moments you always remember about the show. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is one of those moments. I really hope that people watch this scene, this scene in particular, and empathize with what Elizabeth is going through and what she's feeling and how difficult this decision truly is. And I just hope people have so much compassion for her journey and how difficult it is sometimes to follow your heart. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the whole, that's the, I mean, it's what the show is called. It's what the whole theme of the show is, is when calls the heart, following your heart. And I think we like to think of when that's an easy deci decision and it leads to something really joyous and wonderful, but sometimes you have to follow your heart, even if it's a really difficult path and it doesn't lead to something obviously joyful and happy. Right. Like it still is following your heart. And I just hope people, I hope people can see that. I mean, it's look at her performance. Look at Elizabeth. She's so vulnerable. She's so exposed. So switching gears a little bit, there's some scenes with Henry Gowan. There's an opportunity for him to babysit why do you think Rosemary was so willing to leave her brand new baby with Henry so easily? Honestly, I, and I've been in this position myself, when you are a working mother, sometimes it's like the first person you see is the one that's going to get the job because you're just... You're like, I don't know how this is going to fit together. You, you're going to do a good job. I got to get out of here. I got to like, will you watch the child? Okay, great. Just keep the child alive. And uh, I've been in that position myself where you're just like frantically juggling too many things. And I don't think it was a big, at that particular moment, it wasn't a huge vote of confidence in Henry Gowan. It was more out of perhaps desperation and right. franticness of Rosemary of trying to get the job done. But he does such a beautiful job. It's so sweet. Yeah. It's so sweet. Yeah. And you see that connection and him just kind of melting holding the baby. It's beautiful. Yeah. Now, I don't think uh, Martin is anything like his character, Henry, in real life. Was he a natural? I feel like he's just, an, oh I mean, he's goodness. a grandpa, I think, isn't he's he? He's a grandpa. Yeah. He's a wonderful father. He's a wonderful yeah. grandfather. He just, you see him with his kids and he just completely melts. It's the sweetest, yeah. sweetest thing. He is so, so present, so just in love with all of them. No, not like Gowan at all. <laughs> That's why I love how they've warmed up his character yes. because we get to see more of who yes. Martin really is. Yes. I mean, he plays a great bad guy. Yes. And I'm, you love to hate him, but I love to love him more. Yeah. Right? I don't know. He's just a real lovable kind yeah, of guy. Yeah, he is. Yeah. Well, that wraps up 
episode 11 and the season's almost over. We have one left. Anything that you want to say about the season, That how you felt about it? I just hope that the fans have enjoyed this journey and particularly the emotional ride of this season. I think it's it's quite a roller coaster mm -hmm. and i i hope people have enjoyed that and i hope people have come back to each episode with an open heart and compassion and enjoyment for these characters and for their journeys and and just know there's so much more story to tell and uh, we're excited to do it yeah and we're excited to see it <laughs> thanks again for being on the show thank you and that concludes our program. Thanks for tuning in to the deluxe edition of the Edify After Show.